share the same name indeed. Thank you for your generous, uh, generous introduction. We also share, uh, we all come from a, a city called Hudur, <coughs> uh, where, you know, uh, every Somali is very ethnocentric. Our ethnocentricity tells us that Hawali uh, Hudur, uh, you know, uh, we, we don't think that there's, <laughs> we don't think that there's a, a better city than Hudur, really. Yeah. All the other Somali cities, we think <laughs> Hudur is the city. So we also share uh, that one. <coughs> um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, uh, distinguished colleagues and friends, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. It's my pleasure to be here today with you and address an issue which is very uh, pertinent <coughs> to us as Somalis and to the world, I think, in general, which is the issue of peace. I would, uh, however, like to first, before I go into, to into my talk, I would like first to salute the diaspora community, the diaspora Somalis, who are coming from all over the world, <clears throat> which is really very, very uh, uh, fascinating, which makes me also so proud of the Somali diaspora <laughs> that I'm one of them coming to this meeting from all over the continents <clears throat> to share their ideas and contribute what next, what we can do for our, for our people. Uh, we have people who are coming from Australia, who, people who are coming from Southeast Asia, from the Middle East, from many, many countries in Europe, from the United States of America, from Canada, from all over uh, the world. So that really makes me uh, uh, feel that we, the diaspora, we, we really have some concern and we think that we can contribute something uh, for this endeavor, which is the peace. I must also express my profound gratitude uh, to my friends uh, of PDR, Peace and Development Research, uh, who are based in London particularly uh, uh, my brother uh, Salah Sheikh Usman, uh, my brother uh, uh, Abdul Razak Sheikh Mohideen, and my brother Abdul Rashid Haji Hassan. The PDR, <coughs> in fact, uh, without them, I think this wouldn't have been possible. They are the dynamo <coughs> behind uh, this gathering. And I also have a, a center, which is called Center for Peace Building Initiative, I contributed a little, or even my presence here and my daughter, uh, you don't know me, Subeida is my daughter. We all come also for this and uh, our Center for Peace Building Initiative uh, also contributed a lot for this endeavor. Peace, ladies and gentlemen, is very essential to all beings. To Somali life, peace is paramount, without which life will be unbearable. In fact, uh, the, some Somalis, they say, Nabat uh, Iyaano. In fact, Professor Virginia Luling, who is uh, our, our presence here, is also an, uh, an honor for us, edited uh, just volume last year, <coughs> which is entitled Nabat uh, Iyaano, which is uh, uh, milk and peace. <coughs> In fact, Ano um, being the primary dish for the Somali nomad, uh, without Nabat, I mean, he or she cannot enjoy Ano. I mean, they cannot just even have their primary dish without peace. It shows you how so significant that peace is to our culture as Somalis. Our daily greetings, we go like this. Nebede, which means, are you at peace? And the answer would be, Mahat Allah, thank Lord or thank Allah. Therefore, Peace is really a prerequisite uh, for the way, uh, our way, uh, our livelihood. 
Uh, in fact, in today's world, we, we hear lots of, for instance, people who are into developmental issues where they are questioning whether the development will be the first or uh, peace will be the first. Uh, which, which comes first? Uh, from the Somali perspective, I think peace is the first. You cannot have any development without having peace. How you can promote anything. Um, for the last over 20 years, uh, there has been efforts by Somalis to bring about peace to our country over 20 years. These efforts was regional, national, maybe uh, Horn of Africa, international. Uh, we have heard lots of even Somali international peace and reconciliation conferences which took mostly outside of the country. All of these conferences, all of these efforts, they were attempting to bring about a comprehensive peace. Our Somali peace efforts, they were all talking about we have to have the whole nation. In fact, each of these efforts were represented by the entire nation. Most were hosted by friendly nations, neighboring nations, supported by Somalis, including ourselves, those who are in the diaspora, supported by the international community. Whoever loves us, whoever cares about us, they were all supporting these peace initiatives. All these efforts, unfortunately, or let me say most of these efforts, uh, efforts you know, uh, failed. We were expecting, we had a great expectation for every Somali peace meeting. We were all saying this should be the last chance we have. In fact, uh, uh, Ambassador Sahnoun, if you remember, an Algerian ambassador who was there in the early 90s, he wrote a book uh, called Somalia is uh, the missed opportunity. We were always saying, oh, this is our opportunity. We have to make it right now. But unfortunately, most of us were really uh, disappointed. Um, I would like to share with you some of the reasons why these peace efforts failed. Uh, there are many, of course, but let me go over quickly a couple of them. Number one, one of the major reasons for the failure of these uh, peace efforts was ignoring local or indigenous traditions. <clears throat> All these efforts, nobody ever applied what do we know the best, you know? Our local hair, Somalis, we have very strong, deep hair, which really uh, uh, works for the time of peace and the times of war, both. Uh, we are Muslims, uh, our religious traditions, again, complement with our hair, or both hair and religion, they complement each other. None of these uh, really powerful elements were used in making peace uh, for Somalia. Um, was this the first time Somalis were at odds? I don't think so. Was it the first time that we ever had even clan, what we call warfare? I think Somalis have been always fighting throughout their history. I'm a historian, I know uh, different levels. Maybe we are using different technologies. You know, uh, one time we were using Warren and maybe Balawe uh, rather than Kalashnikovs and some other uh, technologies. But we have been always at all. We will find in our tradition many sayings like all nebeda kudumbuyes, all nebeda kudumbuyes, which is every war gives peace. It happens, but yeah, at the end of a war, there must be a peace. Nebeda um, It is only peace that can give, a, can give you milk, the milk that we talk about. Without, without peace, you cannot have uh, a milk. So, in many Somali traditions, if such atrocities takes place, we have even very simple mechanism <coughs> to sort out this problem. Sebenga <laughs> yeah? 
Um, seven uh, uh, is, a, is a symbol. It's a symbolic thing. If I put on your head uh, 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 tusbah, be, uh, the beads that when we pray we, we calculate our, how many times I'm saying Allah. Uh, if I put that beads on you, you will be satisfied. You won't be where you were before. Once I give you that savan, you come close, even if I kill your brother. <clears throat> I haven't seen uh, in any of these peace efforts that some even clans give savan to any clan. And we know that clans were killing each other, right? Uh, so why? I mean, uh, I'm, I'm questioning the lack of using the indigenous aspects of our peacemaking has never been used. We were using United Nations models, some African models, some Islamic models, which is not really deeply rooted to our culture. I would prefer if I use the local one. And it would have solved, uh, I, I believe, lots of things. Number two, I believe that there was lack of trustworthy participants. All of these places that people were meeting, nobody ever sorted out who even, supposedly a clan, who will represent my clan? Do I send to the conference a person who is questioned, who some Somalis might think, he is a criminal of a kind? How, how I can send somebody who will, in fact, give bad image to my even own city or clan? Uh, in a society where such a civil atrocity takes place, we have to really clear first who is who, who is wronged, who made the wrong, once we sort out, then we have some representations that really can represent and can bring about peace. Um, law and order. Um, we haven't even tried, after, uh, after the, uh, the, the collapse of the states, after the civil war, we all assumed we are okay and let's make a, a government right now without thinking, without talking about what has happened, what went wrong with the governments that we had before. Uh, I think nations who have experienced like ours, they all went in a process where first and foremost, I have to know who is the guilty and who is uh, uh, the wronged one. The bystanders as well as the criminals, we have to think of. Even today, uh, the whole world uh, is talking about we have to try some people. We have to bring them to, to court, to justice. You know, I don't think that Liberia would have been in this order unless Charles Taylor was tried. I don't think that uh, Milo unless Milosevic was taken from East Europe, Yugoslavia wouldn't have, wouldn't have been sorted out. Why we thought that we are all angels? I don't know. How can that happen? Hundreds of thousands. In some regions, people think that a quarter of millions died. And they think that they were killed. So I would have, I would have thought that uh, if we have went through this justice way, maybe Somalia's reconciliation would have been different. Third, I think that there's impartial or disinterested mediators. Those who are making mediation for us uh, they, were not, they were not really genuine mediators. They were after some of their own personal interests. In her Hudur, we say, Habar uh, Lamfadaw Mal Warsadaw. If you are interested in, in, the, in the hands of this young lady here, you want to marry and you are asking her hands from somebody who himself is interested in the girl, you will never get that girl, right? They will, he will refuse. He will make all kinds of uh, excuses, right? Those, those who went to negotiations, they were all interested in how to become the president of this nation, how you become the prime minister of this nation, how you, how you make something out of it. So in that regard,
in that regard, um, uh, the, the efforts went in vain simply because our mediators, they were not partial. A mediator in Somalia is ergo. Uh, if you are making ergo and you are ergoing, um, you, are, you shouldn't be part of the, of the thing. You have to, to be fair for these two parts that are fighting. But if I myself, as an ergo, I want to be one of uh, those who are getting something out of it. That won't work. Number four, um, uh, which I think was one of the reasons why these things failed, was uh, reinterpretation of sovereignty. Somalis, until today, we are confused of what constitutes a nation. Um, some of us, from the get-go, they said, I'm not Somali. You know, I, I'm going to be my own self. I'm going to be independent. Some of us are saying, no, I, I want to be independent, but maybe still have partial relation with the so-called Somali Republic. Um, in the world order, Somalia, I, I have been in England in the early 80s. I lived in London in 1980, 81, 82, 83 here. In fact, there were not this many Somalis those days. Uh, but we had an, ambas an embassy here at Edgeware Road, uh, nearby Marble Arch, Somali embassy. <coughs> Uh, do you have an embassy today? No. <laughs> when your number is, in fact, escalating, you are more than 80s here today, and you don't have a consulate that you can, hunt, can handle your own affairs. Uh, that means, from the international point of view, Somalia's state of affairs is not as Kenya, where, where they are well internationally represented. So the question of sovereignty, I think we need to think of how we can make up, how we can uh, remediate, how we can really come up with something. But until today, many Somalis are confused of that uh, uh, nationhood. Um, uh, six, I, I really think that there was lack of addressing issues of clans occupying other clans' territories. We Somalis or many Africans, you know, we only think that European is only those who can colonize. We never thought that Africans can colonize another African. In Somalia, there are good examples that there are groups of Somali Africans who moved and colonized other people's territory. And we, until today, we are shying to address that issue. What's wrong with it? We fought against colonialism, right? We uh, got our freedom from Britain, from Italy, from everywhere, because they were colonizers. So uh, we have to find some voice for even those voiceless who cannot even say it. A Somali, not necessarily to be from that region, uh, the other Somali should really be courageous enough to say, that is wrong. This should stop. So uh, many Somalis started questioning in 1995, when in Baidoa, <coughs> there was a state called the Riverine State, formed in 1995. Within six months or so, it was aborted. It was toppled by uh, another Somali. Um, so they started questioning why this guy really is really toppling this state that emerged right now. Um, so. What I'm trying to say is, we need to think of certain issues that might really raise flags, you know, raise flags of that kind. In fact, Somalia today, we can question, we can raise questions that uh, regions, total regions, that are occupied by some other Somalis. Why we should shy, you know? Uh, and, and we know that we have to be really frank. Unless we are frank enough, we cannot bring about peace. Truth is what really brings about peace. And lastly, but not the least, what I think uh, was what some of the reasons that failed or uh, behind the failure of, of these peace efforts was lack of implementing on what is agreed upon. Out of the last 20 years, Somalis, although, as I said, failed, but there are some areas they were very close. And when we are looking for peace, we have to build on the little things we agreed on first. 
there were several things that we agreed upon, and we are, until today, shying to implement it. Just to give you some examples, in 1993, Addis Ababa Peace Agreement promoted the idea of regional autonomy. It was so rough, so difficult on us. How, how, you, you are anti-Somali unity, you are dividing Somalis. Uh, that was the responses. However, that idea, I think, it was very, very positive issue that we can think of. Because already in 1991, a whole region proclaimed itself that uh, they are independent. Uh, so many of us, like myself, including myself, we believe that Somalia's unity is a sacrosanct. We cannot negotiate. I think we have to uh, entertain, at least, here. Because in Addis Ababa, 1993, those factions who are meeting there, they accommodated the idea of regional autonomy. In, uh, in Cairo Accord, in 1994, the G12, if you remember, they also accommodated the idea of, you know, we can be regions. Uh, the SNM declaration of Somaliland, as I already mentioned, and the Burma Conference in 1993 will also justify that a regional issue could be entertained. Uh, the SDM creation of SGC, Supreme Governing Council. Uh, uh, the SDM, they felt that, yeah, this Supreme Governing Council could probably constitute a couple of regions and then we could go from there. And they created their own government, their own parliament, their president. If you remember, Dr. Hasse was the, uh, one of the uh, presidents of, of, the, of that Supreme Governing Council. Uh, even, I think I heard that Sharif Hassan was the first who, who, who was elected, but Hasse was the, the president. The creation of Puntland in 1997, it shows you, oh, it's possible, you know, if you can bring about peace to having a region, why not? We, what we're lacking is, or looking for is peace, right? Uh, so that regional issue, I think, we can think of. I love the unity of Somalia, but if you can keep that unity with some diversity, I think that is something we can think of. The Sodari Accord, 1997. Sodari, all Somali faction leaders who are there, they agreed upon, upon something so vital for peace. They realized that Somalis are fighting over clan issues. And these clans, are nobody was ever fair when it comes to uh, power sharing. One of the things that they agreed was, why we don't make this executive power rotated? I think that was very positive. You know, rather than always, you know, uh, focusing on one group, this time, we, if this group has uh, the executive order, next time we move to this, next time to this move, and so forth. Uh, the issue of power sharing. There are Somalis who really <laughs> long for, uh, for, for sharing power. If you look at what happened after 97, in 2000, the first transitional national government from ARTA uh, uh, resolutions, uh, the authority went to one group of Somalis. And after five, four years, it moved to another group in, after Mpagati, another group took the power. I was expecting in the third time, we'll move to another third group. But it went back to the same group. So this race question, this was flags, you know. Once we agreed that we are all equal, in fact, they, have, they, they talk about some four, four point something, uh, which is very uh, complicated. Uh, but once we agreed on certain things, I think that rotation would have been something very, very helpful. Uh, because the other groups would say, why really? Why always? Not only from 1997, when we agreed of this rotation, or this power should be between these five groups, even before Somalia's executive authority was always the same as it is today. So we are in the 21st century, ladies and gentlemen, so we have to honor at least implementing whatever we agreed upon. Somalis agreed in ARTA the empowerment of women. It's just a slogan. 
our ladies. Uh, the, in fact, there are some panelists tonight who will talk uh, about women and their role in Somalia. We empowered them, but that was verbal only. Nothing happened. You know, even if they were given something, they were given issues that are related to women and to children or to something, which is not fair. So we have agreed that 50, in today's world, in many societies, uh, 52, 53% of their population are women. Yeah. How we can ignore these powerful sources that we have uh, in Somalia, why we cannot uh, uh, allow them to, to lead us, perhaps uh, uh, for better peaceful situations. Another thing we agreed in Mbagati, in Kenya, in, 19, in 2003, uh, Somalia agreed on multiculturalism. It was so, so new to us that in their first transitional constitution, they said it's official in all official papers of the government. The letterheads should be written in both languages. The passport, anything governmental should be in both languages. The media of instruction should be in both languages. The <laughs> We have national television. It should be half. Half time should be in my, the other half should be in Maha. We have radio Mogadishu. It has to be this. Because we already agreed on. I think if we implement those things, we would be very close to these peace issues that we are lacking today. So what are our chances in, uh, when uh, the TFG goes? In August, we all are waiting to the end of a transitional government. Uh, I don't have much uh, uh, to answer on that, but I have a couple of things to really maybe contribute. Post TFG Somalia, number one, we need to enforce upon what is already agreed upon. I already listed for you guys. If we just implement those things, the post TFG Somalia would be better than it today. Number two, we have to safeguard the unity of Somalia by accommodating uh, regional autonomy. I mean, we, we, can be, we can be regions, but we still have our nation united. Okay, we can do that. Let us honor regions on their historic clan boundaries. Uh, during the British colonial time, ladies and gentlemen, Somalia was only four regions. In fact, they were called uh, uh, Northwest, and they had central, and they had southern and eastern. The British military administration from 1950, I'm sorry, from 1940 to 50, Somalia were only four regions. Maybe that's why we have four and a half right now. Uh, right. <laughs> so, and really, they are very distinct, very distinct if we just uh, accommodate the Somali regions as they were in it is historic perspectives. Um, another uh, a third issue I would like to add is we have to suspend, I may be a little cruel to some of my diasporic Somalis, uh, suspending citizenships of those Somalis who are engaged into criminal acts. We have Somalis who are Britons, who are Americans, who are Canadians, but who in their hands are bloody uh, in something. I, as an American citizen, I cannot do anything illegal. I'm, I'm going to be penalized. Okay, why, why my American government will allow another Somali like me who is an American citizen and will be engaged into crime issues? So I will ask our friendly nations to really, to really think. If they just suspend the citizenship of one of them, it will be a lesson to the others. And then, and then we can find somebody. <laughs> All the warlords, all these money launderers. We, we created fat cats in Somalia. <laughs> my own money that I sweat, when I sent to my mom, <clears throat> uh, my mother is getting what? A, 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 a photocopy of something that doesn't exist internationally. And they are making CEOs and all kinds of titles for my money. 
So therefore, I would warn uh, and I would ask my fr our friends to help us into this, those issues. For, again, I'm, I'm back to what I already said, indigenization of reconciliation, really. We have to indigenize our reconciliation efforts. And instead of really having all these uh, fancy five-star hotel conferences, we can go back to the river. <laughs> and we can have, my father is Malak, and in fact he told me that if, if they accommodate that, I can really help to sorting the Somali problem. Because Somalis, they used to meet under what? Under a tree. We never met under uh, uh, lobbies of hotels and something like that. And finally, I would like that uh, in Somalia, uh, the right men and women to take the right job. One of our difficulties today, people who are sort of running the affairs of Somalia, they are not qualified. They don't have the character, the capacity that they can do these things. How on earth, how on earth, if, uh, uh, in America, uh, I, have a, I have a PhD, but if I go to uh, apply a job to working part-time in McDonald's, my PhD won't help me. I have to be trained to how to really serve people who are coming to that place. We don't have a trained Somali for these jobs, ladies and gentlemen. We are not qualified for these jobs. So I call upon all Somalis that the right men and women to be in the right job. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.